What did he teach? Well, we need to ask him and interview him. And we're going to be flipping all through 1 Peter, 2 Peter, and the book of Acts. But let me just interview Peter. Because Peter played a prominent part in the early church. The book of Acts records several of his sermons. He authored two books in the Holy Scriptures. And if we study what he said, it will focus light on the attitude that he had after personally being taught by Christ, after walking with him for three and a half years, after seeing him risen from the dead, after serving him till he was a martyr and died. What did he believe and teach about the church? And how would he have answered questions that both Catholics and Protestants are asking in our ecumenical age? Well, Peter's replies, and I'm going to read to you, are from what he said and what he wrote. And I'm going to be quoting you. You can follow along in your Bibles, but I'm actually reading from the approved confraternity edition from the Roman Catholic imprimatur Bible from the church itself. So you can see it's almost exactly what we have. And so when I read what Peter says, it's from the Roman Catholic Bible. Question number one, and if you can just imagine Peter standing like Martin Luther, and we're in the chamber, and, and he's standing as a little lectern, and he's got his Bible there. Peter, could you simply tell us how we can be saved from our sins? Well, he answers in Acts 2.21. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How about 1 Peter 1 and verse 13, which is very close to where we were. Set your hope completely upon the grace which is brought to you in the revelation of Jesus Christ. Set your hope, what? Completely on Jesus Christ. Also in Acts 10.43, To him all the prophets bear witness that through his name all who believe in him may receive forgiveness of sins. Peter, another question. Do those who have trusted the Lord Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins, do they have to anticipate purgatory when they die? Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, across the page in my Bible. I'm going to read to you 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 6 to answer. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his great mercy hath begotten us again through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead unto a living hope, unto an incorruptible inheritance, undefiled, unfading, reserved for you in heaven by the power of God, you are guarded through faith for salvation, which is ready to be revealed in the last time over this. Rejoice. You think Peter believed in purgatory? Did he know about purgatory? No. What do you think? He said you have reservations in heaven. And they're guarded and they're secure. And they're so secure you can rejoice as if you had them now. And he says at the instant of your entering into the presence of God, you will not face fire. You will face, by the power of God, your salvation, which is a living hope that is not corruptible. Well, Peter, let's ask you another question. Surely, St. Peter, even the true believer has a residue of sins for which he has to make restitution to God in penance, doesn't he? Well, look at chapter 2 again, verse 21. First Peter 2.21 for Peter's answer. And also verse 24. Christ has suffered for you, who himself bore our sins in his body upon the tree, that we, having died to sin, must live to justice, and by his stripes you were healed. Not by your stripes in purgatory. Not by your merit gained through suffering. Peter did not believe that we needed to make any restitution to God. Well, here's another one. Peter, is it possible for grace to be purchased by us in any way? Yeah, that's what the Catholic Church dispenses constantly, the dispense grace. The Roman Catholic Church has become the sole dispenser in our world of the grace of God that has been entrusted to it. Peter, can we purchase this grace? Well, look at verse 18 of chapter 1 of First Peter. And let me read to you what Peter would answer to that. Verses 18 and 19. You know that you were redeemed from the vain matter of life handed down from your fathers, not with perishable things as silver or gold, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Now, listen to Acts 8, verses 20 and 22, because Peter actually had someone come to him with money. 
And they, they saw the power of God in his life, if you remember, in Acts chapter 8. And Simon came to him and he says, let me purchase this. Let me have that. I want to buy that. This is what it says in Acts 8.20. Thy money go to destruction with thee. You know what that literally says. Go to hell with thee. I mean, it's a, I was reading the Phillips translation, and he said uh, Peter used what, what people use in their conversations all the time, only he meant it. And he says, he says, may your money go to the pit of destruction with you because you have thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. What does the Roman Catholic Church teach today? The gift of God is purchased with money. Peter says, go to the pit with that. Thou hast no part or lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray to God that perhaps this thought of thy heart may be forgiven thee. Probably the most vehement denunciation that ever came out of the Apostle Peter's mouth was for those who thought in Acts 8, 20, 22, that they could purchase God's grace. Well, Peter, here's another question. What is your opinion on baptismal regeneration? Are we brought into God's family through the sacrament of baptism? Is that how we're born again? Well, let's look again at chapter 1 of 1 Peter, his letter, verse 23. Because here's a clear answer. For you have been reborn, not from corruptible seed, but from incorruptible, through the word of God who lives and abides forever. You understand what he said? What can wash away my sins? The waters of baptism? No. The sacraments? No. The, the ministry of merit from the church? No. You're born again, and I was born again, and all are born again through the living and abiding Word of God because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God and it is that implanted Word that's engrafted in our heart. James 1.22 says that, and 23 says that saves us. Well, Peter, do you think that everyone will eventually be saved? Let's look at 2 Peter 3 and verse 7. His second letter, chapter 3, verse 7. This is a question on universalism, which is something that all uh, ecumenical dialogue is headed toward. Will everyone eventually get to heaven? Verse 7 of chapter 3. But the heavens that now are and the earth by that same word have been stored up, being reserved for fire against the day of judgment and, listen, and the destruction of ungodly men. Did Peter think everybody would eventually get to heaven? No. They will not eventually all be saved. St. Peter, do you think a Christian should be expected to keep all the ordinances and traditions which have grown up around the true faith? Acts 15, and I draw your attention to the great church council in Acts 15, verses 10 and 11, because this is what was expressed at that council. Why then do you now try to test God by putting on the necks of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe we are saved through the grace of our Lord Jesus, not the ordinances and traditions of the church. 